Hey everybody, Jim and Roth here to talk about season three of House of Cards. Full spoilers. Full spoilers ahead. So if you haven't seen it, circle back after you have and watch this. Roth, overall, how do you think this season compared to seasons one and two? I actually like this season. I think I liked it a little more than some other folks, but um, I would agree with our reviewer, Matt Fowler, that it felt very discongruent with what the series had established previously. To me, the first season was the best one. It was the most enjoyable. It was kind of, it was sharp. We were just getting to know these characters. It, you know, sort of the, the appeal of the Underwoods was just just being discovered and how far they would go in their ambitions. Um, season two, they became almost unbeatable. Um, n there was no conflict because no one could match them right. in terms of cunning and guile. Full of words today. Um, but then Matt put it in a way in his review that I thought made a lot of sense, which was that things almost became too big, a little too soapy um, in season two. It had charted that line very well in season one. So they kind of chiseled them down to be more human characters, which I really enjoyed. There was something about the politics of the season and the president himself, the fact that he couldn't do his dirty work anymore for himself. It was yeah. really fascinating to watch. But at the same time, they didn't seem like the same characters, particularly Claire. She didn't seem like she was acting in the way that the Claire that we had come to know. Well, explain that a little bit uh, for the folks. Uh, in, she made a decision that's going to have a huge impact on what's going to happen next season, I'm sure, but also on just the fact that, you know, Frank Underwood as a sitting president running for re-election. You know. Yeah, so, so first of all, peppered throughout the season, they both sort of have moments of crisis of conscience. Claire had a little bit of that previously, but they were able to reconcile their morals pretty quickly and do lots of murder <laughs> and stuff. Especially, I mean, not Claire so much, but definitely Frank. Um, which he still is okay with the murder and stuff, as we <laughs> discovered. Um, but Claire, the one thing that the Underwoods had, as noxious as they were and toxic, as much as she was this Lady Macbeth and he was this ruthless killer and uh, full of ambitious, they had a really nice marriage. <laughs> you know, they're, I was always like, wow, they they have a really they nice marriage. Right? Okay. No, <laughs> right? They like they're like a team. They're this amazing team and this character Tom came in who's writing this book that highlighted that this season. I thought that was really interesting too. Them as this united front, but that dissolved over the course of the season to the point that Claire actually left him, which... Yeah. You, do, you don't think that, you don't buy that as a part of her character. I really don't because yeah. I mean, think about it. Think about any political marriage. Like he is a sitting president. He is running for reelection. Her, to be in the middle of a divorce is unthinkable. Yeah. She's, I just don't think that she would sink the ship that way. I think she would negotiate with him to get things that she wanted um, and maybe leave him later. Yeah, you always see those National Enquirer stories of like the president and the first lady, any president and first lady being like, they're done, it's a dead marriage. Yeah. As soon as he's out of office, she's gone and they never get divorced. They never get divorced because <laughs> it's like they've made a pact for life, right? Yeah. And so like, especially this couple, I just, Claire just behaved in a couple of ways, made some rash decisions this season, which were totally out of character. She is not a rash person at all. In no way. Neither one of them is. But you don't think she's the character who's actually had the most interesting arc this season, or at least the most dramatic, I guess. They are f fabulous the, uh, in, the, in these roles. Yeah. But I think Doug Stamper actually had the best arc this season, and chiseling down and kind of finding the humanity worked the best for him. We thought he was dead last season. Obviously, he wasn't. Um, and the first episode focused so heavily on Doug but that sort of made sense to me because the story of the season seemed to be a lot of ways about Doug coming back to life, coming back to the Doug that he was, who has this psychotic loyalty to Frank Underwood. <laughs> and he has this moment with Rachel, who that was a fascinating relationship, this woman that he's half protecting, half in love with, really manipulating, definitely obsessed with. That moment on the road where it looks like he's going to let her go and then he stops his car. I remember watching it. And yeah. I was sweating, going, oh, my God, he's going to turn around. And he did. <laughs> and just that shot of her face getting covered with dirt, it was Doug burying the last little bit of his soul. Yeah. And then it made me think of this girl 
who had done nothing wrong but be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and how many people are out there buried in an unmarked grave that no one cares about. It was I know, it's really dark, but to me it was the most effective moment of the season. <laughs> You're an IGN happy place. <laughs> uh, let's talk about let's talk about next season. Look, uh, I I have read the the novels, the original novels, and we've both seen the original British TV series, so we know how that story ends. Uh, how do you think this this story, the Americanized version, how it's going to play out? Yeah, I don't know if I really thought they were heading in that direction yeah. by the end of this season, but nope. Um, I think they're really trying to get as much out of these characters and the story as they can. Yeah. Um, Certainly, it's set up for... I mean, for, he does technically, I mean, he has a whole other term if he wins re-election and all that jazz, you know? Yeah, if he wins re-election, I mean, the story of next year will probably be about trying to negotiate his re-election campaign without Claire. Yeah. Um, does Claire somehow become a problem for him? Does she join forces with another candidate, which wouldn't really make much sense at all? Yeah. Um, but that becomes, I think, where they're heading, and I'm, I, I feel pretty on the fence about it. Yeah, I, I kind of I, I like the compact nature of the original structure of the books, and of the British miniseries. That you know, there was that kind of definitive end point, and I, I am curious if they're just going to try and, and either evade that completely just to keep the cash cow going, or if they'll go there. But um, that's all we'll say on that for right now. It's not like there are. 20 odd year old books and TV series out there that you, that can, you can look get up. your answers to. I mean, there's some really high highs this season. You oh, know, there's yeah. some great moments. Some high highs. There we go. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, uh, for all things House Getting of Cards high. and we're off being high or whatever she's not. For all things House of Cards, keep it here on IGN.